Again, if you were here last week, uh, we talked about uh, chapter 12 being basically the critical juncture in, in, the, in Matthew's gospel. Uh, Matthew uh, 4 to 12, he's laying out the foundation, proving over and over again that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the coming king. And then in chapter 12, we have uh, committed what Jesus refers to as the unpardonable sin. And again, the unpardonable sin was not an individual sin. It was a national sin by that generation of Jews uh, represented by the Pharisees, sent by the Sanhedrin that rejected the Messiahship of Jesus. Not only did they reject him as the Messiah and his coming king, his offer to bring his kingdom, uh, their explanation for uh, doing so and not accepting because they, they did not deny his miracles and what he did, but they said that he did it in the power of Satan. Of course, Jesus went through and uh, rebuked them and gave logical, sound, scriptural reasons for why uh, He is the Messiah. Uh, but from that point on, everything changes. Uh, the teaching now goes to parables. You know, again, we went through the Sermon on the Mount. He's, uh, he basically, He's teaching everybody at this point. We're going to see Him now begin to teach in parables. And again, a, a parable is is uh, just a Greek word that we transliterate into in English, and it means just, in a sense, to lay something down straight. In other words, if you, if you had something, uh, a rod or something that had a slight bent in it, it would, might be hard to detect unless you had something you knew to be straight and you laid it right next to it. Oh, then it becomes obvious. I see where it's bent. So a parable is a story or is an illustration to help us see the, uh, the truth of something. And uh, Jesus will begin teaching that way. Uh, and he'll do it because now the focus is on his 12 guys. Uh, the, 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 the nation, in a sense, has rejected him as the Messiah. And at this point, he will begin focusing on uh, training those uh, 12 guys. Let's take a look at, uh, at the verse, first nine verses. And uh, we'll see that Jesus' instruction, again, obviously takes on the form of parables. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Uh, such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattered the seed, some fell along the path, and birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still others fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or even thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. And uh, first thing we notice is that, uh, again, this is the beginning of uh, teaching uh, in instruction. And, and notice it says, uh, again, with uh, details are important, uh, it says that same day. That same day as what? That same day that his mother and his brothers and his sisters came and wanted to see him. Remember, that was the last thing that we covered. Uh, and he said, who are my mother, my sisters, and my brothers? It's you guys. It's those that do the will of my Father that's, uh, that's in heaven. The same day that Jesus is talking about what it is to have a true relationship with him, a personal relationship with him, then he goes out and he begins to uh, to uh, teach in uh, in parables, and notice he says that it was uh, that he went out of the house. Notice the personal pronoun there, the house. That means it was Jesus's house. Again, Jesus is living there on the Sea of Galilee at this point. Uh, we don't know if uh, if Mary and his other brothers and sisters have uh, have moved with him. We certainly have no mention of Joseph at uh, at this point in the life of Jesus, and he is presumed to have uh, have already passed away. But it's uh, Jesus' house. He goes out. He's at the Sea of Galilee. And again, the setting is important because he's not in Capernaum. He's in a place where, as he tells this parable, looking up from that seashore, even uh, as uh, 
uh, I've had the privilege to do from right there. You can look up and see the fields that he's talking about. You can see the rocky places. You can see the pathways. It's all right there before him. The other thing to note is it says um, here, in a, at least in an NIV, large crowds. Uh, uh, this in the, indicates basically that there were thousands of people that were there. It could have said crowd. It could have said, but it says crowd plural, and then it, uh, you know, again, the word large, large crowds. In other words, there were thousands of people now gathered on the shore so much that Jesus has to get in a boat. So again, even though, and the point is, uh, even though nationally he's been rejected, part of what he's going to begin to teach in terms of the mysteries of the kingdom of God, the secrets of the kingdom of God, the first one is, how do people get saved? You know, how do people come into that kingdom? Uh, Even though nationally he's been rejected, now the ministry continues to the individual. As he trains his guys, they're not going to go out and bring in a messianic kingdom for the nation of Israel, for that generation of Jews, but they are going to go out and bring a gospel so that individual people will come in a relationship with him so close it's like brothers, sisters, and, and, uh, and so forth. So uh, there's, a real, there's a real turning in, in philosophy of ministry as well as the teaching of ministry because things have uh, changed because of what took place in chapter 12. Uh, again, the second thing about this is that these new instructions give great insight, uh, obviously, as I mentioned, into evangelism. And we're probably all pretty familiar with this, this parable. And in fact, in, uh, in Mark's gospel, it says, uh, Jesus says to them, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand any parable? It's the first one. So the typology that's laid out here obviously is going to carry through the, uh, the rest of the parables. But it helps us understand a few things. Why is it that when we have a Harvest Crusade and Greg Laurie is here and we see hundreds and hundreds of people go forward at Aloha Stadium, why aren't there hundreds and hundreds of those same people in churches, you know, uh, you know, six months later, a year later, five years later? Why, why is that? Uh, why does it seem like, uh, you know, again, especially at those large events, not everybody is really walking with the Lord later? Well, Jesus is going to give us some instruction here or explanation, at least uh, in this parable, as to why that uh, why that's happened. You guys have probably have friends or family members. You you prayed with them. They seem to pray to receive the Lord, but in the vernacular we say sometimes doesn't seem to stick. You know, it's just what, what's going on here. They said the right words. They said the right thing. They said they had the right belief system. Uh, what's and they seem some of them seem to be very enthusiastic about it uh, initially. So what happened there? Are they saved or are they not saved? Uh, what's going on? A lot of that is cleared up in this parable as well. Uh, and as we get to the explanation of it, we'll talk more about that. So again, instructions now take on the form of parables. And secondly, Jesus informs his disciples as to why he now teaches in parables. And we see that in verses 10 to 17. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's hearts have become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see in your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So we first know that Jesus taught in parables actually to hide the meaning, (laughs) Uh, to hide the meaning. He's in a sense, he's kind of given up on the masses and certainly he's given up on this uh, uh, this idea of ended in terms of bringing in the messianic kingdom and and so forth. And uh, and basically he's going to uh, teach uh, these parables and then give the meaning to his disciples. Now, the other thing to note is that um, uh, and, and we've kind of mentioned this before. The parables that Jesus teach were taught by all rabbis. They, they all taught the same parables. 
Uh, this is, so it's not like they're going, they're going, oh, I heard this before. But again, but what was distinct and different about Jesus is that he brought the application then to what it meant and how it applied to their lives. And he did that uh, without quoting another rabbi. Because if you're going to teach a heavenly truth, a, a, a godly concept, then you certainly don't want to have people think that you're speaking on your own authority as though you're God. So you have to quote another rabbi. You see, but Jesus doesn't do that. He just says it because he is God. That, that upset a few people. And that's why they said, wow, nobody's ever taught like this. He teaches with authority. It's not because of what he's saying is so different. It's the way he did it and the authority that he used. He spoke directly on behalf of God. And, uh, and that kind of perked people's ears up here a little bit. Obviously, that upset the, uh, the Pharisees as well. Uh, again, why did he explain the parable to his disciples? In verse 11, he says, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. So he's going to explain the meaning to them, uh, but not to the others. Uh, again, these disciples that have these secrets uh, of the kingdom, uh, in this case, this parable, how is it that people get saved? Why do some people seem to and they're not? As he gives this explanation, they're, they're going to understand it. There's, they're going to understand a lot more. And as they understand it and receive it, then they're going to be given more. Uh, people that have rejected him, even the spiritual truth that they might have had at the beginning, even that will be taken away. Uh, and Jesus mentions that by quoting uh, Isaiah. Uh, so secondly, we note that Jesus taught in parables and fulfillment of, uh, of prophecy. And he, again, here he is quoting Isaiah. And he mentions that the people's hearts are, are calloused. And if they weren't ca so calloused, then uh, if they would turn to him, he would heal them. Uh, but again, uh, though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, uh, they may not understand. So again, uh, in a sense, a paradox of truth. Uh, the disciple in Jesus Christ, as we come to faith in Christ... Uh, he teaches us even more. Uh, we learn even more uh, truth, you know, from from the Bible. Uh, the person that rejects, and again, Paul talks about this in Romans one that that for everybody it's the same. Everybody has two witnesses. They have creation and the outer witness that declares the, the glories of majesties of God, His quote invisible qualities and so forth. And they have the internal witness of of the conscience. Everybody's got that. And Paul says that the problem is they can either recognize that God's there, He is the creator, and, and, de and desire to long uh, to know more of Him, and God will be faithful to, uh, to do that. And we've given uh, examples of different cultures and people groups where that's exactly what's happened. And, and certainly close to home here is, uh, is the uh, Hawaiian people that reached out in that way. And, and that's why we have the Hawaiian kingdom being uh, uh, really a Christian kingdom for so many years because uh, very high percentages, you know, 85, some people say 90, 95 percent of the Hawaiians at one time were, were all Christians. And um, uh, it's because of this idea that they recognized there was one true God. They cried out to know him. Uh, and, uh, and basically, then when the missionaries show up and again, they destroy the whole kapu system. When the missionaries show up, they say, we're here to tell you about the one true God that's a God of love. They embrace it and uh, Christianity spreads uh, like crazy. But Paul says, so they were given even more. And even more knowledge, even more truth, the scriptures and so forth in their own language. But Paul says, is what Jesus is saying here, but those that reject that basic truth of a witness that's external uh, and internal in terms of the conscience, even a little bit they have then is taken uh, away from them. Sometimes people look at this and uh, read this verse in, in Isaiah and they, well, I, don't, I don't know if that's really fair. You know, kind of a thing. But we see it, you know, on an earthly level uh, all the time. Two kids go to school. Uh, one loves going to school. He works hard. He's learning. He's getting good grades. He's getting all the pats on the back and, and everything. And then he graduates and he gets a scholarship and gets to go on and learn more. You know, and then another student comes along. He could care less. He rejects the whole thing. It's, he is not interested. And he's not getting the pats on the back. And he's not getting the good grades. And he's not getting the scholarship. And Five years later, he can't even remember <laughs> what he learned to start with. Even what he had has been taken away. Uh, so we, we could see it lived out on an on our earthly plane, but there's certainly a greater dynamic and, uh, and maybe a, a little bit of a, a frightening one. You know, this idea that somebody can reject God and reject God and pretty soon their heart is so calloused 
um, they, they can't even see, see the obvious uh, that's, that's out there. To one is given even more, to the other, what he has is taken away. The other explanation for us from Paul is 2 Corinthians 4.3. There he says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So on top of that, you've got Satan that understands the dynamic of this. He's doing everything he can to spiritually blind people to keep them from seeing uh, the light of the truth of the gospel. Now, if you're a Christian and you've been walking with the Lord for a while, you've got some basic Bible knowledge, uh, th- this all seems like a, a slam dunk, if I can use the vernacular. You know, door number one, you know, all your sins forgiven, a clear conscience, you're going to be with the Lord forever and glory, so on and so forth. Door number two, they, we mentioned that that's hell, eternal punishment forever and ever. Let's see, tough choice. This is not a tough choice, you know. Uh, you know, why is it seems so obvious to people that have stepped through door number one, uh, but to others it's like, well, I don't know. I've got plenty of time, maybe, maybe that's true. You know, you get all of the, well, why don't they? Well, Jesus is going to, again, explain that uh, in the parable, but... It helps us to understand as we go through it to start with is that if you have a friend, a family member, a neighbor that you're praying for, and and, and I encourage you to develop some kind of a list of people that are not just your own needs and so forth, but people that are not saved, that are close to you, that you pray for on a regular basis. One of the things you want to pray for is that God would remove the blindness that the that Satan has placed upon their eyes that keeps them from seeing the obvious in terms of the truth of who Jesus is, our own spiritual condition as sinners, and the only way to salvation is is really to be forgiven through the, the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, the third thing about this, again, Jesus taught in parables because of the secrets of the kingdom. Uh, he, he announces that here, the knowledge of the secrets of the, of the kingdom of God. Uh, what was the mystery? Well, in context, it's the postponement of the Messianic kingdom. The Messiah comes, you know, he is there, he presents himself, he authenticates himself, he presents all of his credentials, he fulfills all the scriptures and so forth, and, and he's rejected. So now that kingdom is postponed. Again, that generation of Jews is going to be uh, punished for that. And a future generation is going to be given that offer again. That future generation uh, of Jews is going to be uh, during the tribulation period. Uh, that's kind of in a, in a broad brush. It also means very specific things. It means there would be a, a time between the Messiah's rejection and his acceptance. Uh, again, he makes reference to the fact that how, you know, prophets long to know this. And Peter uh, mentions that uh, as well in uh, in First Peter 1.10. It says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. You can imagine Isaiah and the boys trying to get a handle on this. I mean, they're all about the Messianic kingdom. I mean, you know, Jesus coming, the conquering king, and he's going to take over and establish his kingdom. And it's going to, he's going to reign on the throne of David, and he's going to be there forever and ever. And, and all of that's in the Bible. It's all there. And, and uh, if you're Jewish living in that day and under some kind of oppression, you're ready. It's kind of like we're ready for heaven now, kind of, kind of a thing sometimes. But as they predict that, Isaiah is also predicting that the Messiah would come and suffer. In Isaiah 53, David in Psalm 22 predicts that the, uh, that the Messiah would suffer. And they're basically saying, what's that all about? They're trying to figure out the time and circumstances. How does this work out? They're longing to figure it out, and they can't figure, uh, figure it out. Again, the idea that the Messiah would come and then be rejected by the nation just kind of didn't fit. Why, why, why would that happen? How could that happen? But uh, Jesus is saying uh, it was a mystery, but now it's been revealed to you. It's being revealed to them. This idea that the Messiah would come twice. It was a mystery that he would come once and actually be rejected and would have to come again and then be accepted uh, by a different generation uh, of Jews and of Jewish leadership. 
The other thing that's part of this is this mystery that they could not understand in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets, is that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all those who receive the Messiah by faith alone. Again, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon uh, priests, prophets, and kings to do a certain thing and then departed. So the, uh, that's why David would say, and Lord, take not thy spirit from me. So this concept that God would pour out his spirit, which he does in, in Acts 2, following the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that the Holy Spirit would indwell every believer and not depart and be with us forever and lead us and guide us and be our counselor and our comfort and all that. That was a complete mystery uh, in, in the Old Testament. That was part of the secrets uh, of the kingdom. Uh, and again, the, uh, the ultimate secret that, uh, that there would be this body of believers referred to as the body of Christ, later referred to as the church that is made up of Jews and Gentiles together. That was a mystery. <laughs> that was a mystery. Again, the Old Testament predicted you know, that the, the whole world would be a blessing. The assumption was, <laughs> I think, the whole world would become Jewish so they could receive the Jewish Messiah. So again, and this is something these guys, guys don't get and have real trouble with early on through the book of Acts and uh, until Paul messes everything up and goes out and starts preaching to Gentiles and the Holy Spirit is poured out and so forth. And we see the conclusion of that or at least the council on it in Acts 15. Anyway, mysteries of the secret of the kingdom of God. Uh, it means a lot of things specifically and generally it means that the messianic kingdom, the kingdom of Christ is now being postponed. But it's going to come and we're all looking forward to it uh, in the future. How long will it be postponed? Well, Jesus talks about it in Luke 21, 24. He says about the end times, they will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all nations. Speaking of um, the Jews in Israel, Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. There's going to be a point in time in the end when these kind of uh, cataclysmic events are happening in the heavenlies and so forth, the things that Joel prophesied, the things that we read about in the book of Revelation. And there's going to be that the times of the Gentiles are done, the time of the Gentiles ruling over Jerusalem. It's a, a little bit of a discussion these days in the news. Uh, when, when that would end and when the, the Jews would actually be able to retake the Temple Mount again, and uh, there's a point in time when Jesus comes back in the clouds. Uh, that's when that offer will come again at the end of the times of the Gentiles. So, again, a little, a little theology there. Maybe a little too much, but uh, got to have a little foundation stones there. Got instructions about teaching, the forms of parable. Everything changes for Jesus in his teaching. He informs the disciple as to why he now teaches in, in, the, uh, in parables because it's all changing. And they, they see that and they understand that. And then, uh, and then verses 18 to 23, uh, Jesus explains the illustration or, or the parable. And I've uh, kind of saved the explanation uh, for this portion. Verse 18 says, Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed fell on rocky places, the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since uh, he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution become, uh, comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. It produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Uh, again, so here, first we know the illustration relates to the condition of the heart. And, uh, and again, the, the message of the kingdom is compared to a farmer who's going out and uh, sowing seeds. A familiar parable and certainly a familiar sight 
uh, to all of them. Uh, first, we know that Jesus thought that some people are like the seed that fell upon the hard path. And again, uh, we already have the story of, of the disciples walking across one of those paths, cutting through a field, and then pulling the grain and eating it. And uh, they end up in a big discussion because it's on the, on the Sabbath or on the Shabbat. So uh, again, the, these paths, if you've ever even seen that, I mean, doing any work or whatever, it doesn't take long for uh, soil that's dug up to have people walking across it. It, it gets pretty hard. Uh, of course, as the farmer's out there sowing his seed, if, if something hits on that hard path, it's almost like concrete after a while. It just lays there. It's not going anywhere. Uh, and then, of course, the, the birds come in and can pluck it up and fly off with it. That's literally what Jesus is pointing to. And then he explains that that hard path is like a person's heart. Uh, and the birds that come, he explains, is the devil or Satan again. Uh, this parable is told in Mark as well as Luke. And so therefore, Satan is very much uh, at work when it comes to this idea of preaching the gospel and evangelism and everything else. I mean, we can be out sharing. Uh, we could do it in a big public setting. We could do it one-on-one -on -one with folks, you know, over the airways, through TV, radio, and all the other things that we're, we're able to do now, uh, the Internet. But uh, not everybody gets saved because some people's hearts are so hard towards the gospel. Uh, and the little bit that comes in terms of, again, what is the seed? It's the Word of God. In this case, it's the gospel. And Satan comes and just, and just takes it away. Uh, it, it just shows us that he is directly involved. And, and uh, if you have family members that are not saved, I'm just going to say it's going to require an intense amount of prayer sometimes to see them come to the Lord. And maybe over a long period of time. And maybe you need to initiate uh, other folks uh, in, in the process. I remember one of the, one of the guys from India was visiting us a number of years. One of the guys that we uh, ministered with uh, over there uh, in the past. And uh, one of the uh, gals that was uh, in the church at the time, husband was not saved. And uh, she asked him about, uh, about that. And, you know, she's just very concerned and so forth. And, and he said, um, he says, uh, well, are you praying? Oh, of course I'm praying. And he says, well, uh, sister, are you, uh, how often are you fasting? Oh, well, I haven't ever, oh, you must fast. I would start one day a week, at least one day a week. If you want to see your husband say, fast at least, and pray all day, at least one day a week. Do this for at least six months. If he's not saying two days a week, two days a week, at least see it. If not, for another for three or four months. If not, say three days a week, uh, as much as you can. Get other people. Uh, evidently, he was a little more concerned about her husband getting saved than she was. But uh, I mean, this is, I mean, like I see, I go over with these guys. I feel like Barney Fife coming back because they're so intense about what they do. They take this all very seriously. If Jesus says Satan keeps people from getting saved, we better do what we can do. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The battle's in the heavenlies. And that's how we enter in. If we really care, if we're going to see him get saved. But uh, interesting, in 1980, George Gallup did a poll to determine how many, quote, born again Christians there were in this country in 1980. George Gallup, uh, he estimated that there were 50 million born again Christians in this country in 1980. In 1990, George Barna, not George Gallup, George Barna, who is also a, a pollster, he decided to follow that up. He went back to the same addresses and the best he could track down those 50 million people. And then he asked them very specific questions. Are you a born again Christian? And this is what I mean. You have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You've committed your life to Jesus Christ. You believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And it was only his blood that for, could forgive you. Uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. he laid it all out. Uh, and he found that that uh, in 10 years, in reality, only one in 10 of those by that definition, uh, just a, a basic sharing of the gospel of that definition, only one in 10 were actually born again. The whole point is, and I think the point of this parable as we go through it, there's a lot of people that think that they're saved, and according to Jesus, they're not. You know, and I, I, I just see that through the teaching of Jesus over and over. That, that's got to be a, a, a great concern. Uh, we live in a culture now that 98% of Americans say they believe in God in some, in some form. Uh, but... Um, but again, there's, there's uh, half of those say that they're Christian. Uh, well, our, our country would look a lot different 
if there was that many Christians running around that were really born again. So it's, it's possible to have an intellectual assent to some information, obviously, and still not be saved. But, but here in this first point, we see that uh, uh, Satan is very much uh, in, uh, involved here. Uh, secondly, Jesus taught that some people are like seed that fell on rocky places. In, in Israel, there's, lo- there's lots of rocky places, but there's especially places where there's a, 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 a limestone that sits just below the, the surface of the soil. So there could be two or three or four inches of soil, and then it's just nothing but a bed of lime under it. And, uh, of course, that limestone uh, heats up, you know, which really helps germination. So the seeds hit it, and they, and they perk up real quick and sprout up their little heads, and they really start uh, growing very, very quickly. But, of course, they're not going to go anywhere because there's no soil, and the little bit that is there can't hold any moisture. Uh, they di- die very quickly. So that's, the, that's the, what uh, Jesus is making reference to here. In terms of the person that's like this, he says that times of testing come, when things heat up, literally with persecution, pressure, then their faith withers and it begins to uh, fall, fall away. There's initial enthusiasm, uh, but uh, it uh, dissipates uh, very, very quickly. And um, uh, it's important to understand, as we go back, remember almost how we began this section when Jesus began to teach his 12 guys one of the things he was really heavy on them was the fact that you're going to be persecuted. And he says, all men will hate you. It's like, there wasn't, we don't share that a lot during altar calls, you know, but, but Jesus did. Jesus, he just told them straight right out. Why? Because I mean, if, you know, you come to the Lord, you say that prayer, everything's going to be great. And all of a sudden, literally all hell breaks out against you. It's like, what is going on here? You know, it's what's going on. But, it, but if you expect it, you anticipate it, you've been told to expect these things. And it's like, well, OK, I just got to hang on here and grow in my faith and so forth. Uh, listen to how uh, Paul, Paul uh, preached the same way in the book of Acts, Acts 14, 21. It says they preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples Encourage them them to remain true to the faith. Quote, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, and if you read the book of Acts, Paul just told them straight out the same thing that, uh, uh, that Jesus did. There's kind of a, a classic uh, Ray Comfort illustration from a message he gives called Hell's Best Kept Secrets. And uh, uh, I've used it before, but just, uh, if you have, just hang in here with me if you heard it. But it illustrates the, the, the problem here. Uh, if you had two guys and they were getting on an airplane, one guy's getting on the airplane, uh, is uh, we're all kind of accustomed to, except in this case, the flight attendant there gives him a parachute to put on as he's getting on the plane. And she says, or he says, uh, please put this on. It would be uh, really essential uh, for you to wear. And it's tremendously comfort. It's going to make your flight so much more enjoyable uh, to, to wear. And she goes on different reasons why he should keep the parachute. Well, of course he sits down, this thing's pushing on his back, uh, you know, and then she comes by and spills coffee on his lap. And, you know, and he's like, man, you know, and finally, he's just like, what, what is up with this? He, you know, of course he, he, he t- undoes the seatbelt. He takes the thing off, puts the seatbelt on. Well, uh, another guy gets on a, a different plane, the flight attendant, he or she greets, uh, greets him and says, uh, we need you to wear this parachute. And the reason we need you to wear it is because there is, there is a high probability this plane is going to go down before it reaches its destination. And if you don't have this chute on, you're going to die. This is going to be the only thing that saves you. Well, see, that's different. Now, he puts it on. It's uncomfortable, but he don't care. Uh, spill coffee on me. That don't matter. I'm, you know, I'm keeping this. If he believes what she said, he's keeping the chute on. See, that's, that's the difference between why some people fall away, supposedly, and, and others don't. If you believe that coming to faith in Jesus Christ is the thing that keeps you from going to hell and being tormented for all eternity, you don't care about persecution. You don't care about the worries of the life. You don't care about a lot of stuff because you're going to be with Jesus forever. And that's it. And that's the bottom line. By the way, that's why you're supposed to get saved. Now, sometimes... 
is presented because there are benefits to walking with the Lord in terms of the abundant life that Jesus promised us, you know, his fellowship, his partnership, you know, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. You know, we could go on and on. Sometimes uh, we come to the Lord in, in times of real trouble and he does a miracle and heals a marriage or gets a job or, you know, people people come to the Lord sometimes in crisis and the Lord intervenes in those crises. That's not always the case, but that's not why we get saved. We get saved because it's the difference between heaven and hell. And uh, anyway, that I would say that's one of hell's best kept secrets as well. That's the, the name of that message that that illustration come from. Jesus is right out front. Okay, guys, you're going to follow me. This is how it's going to be. I'm going to empower you to, you know, go off on my behalf. And, and by the way, it ain't going to be easy. And people are going to persecute you. Some of you guys are going to get beaten and all men will hate you. You guys still with me on this? Okay. You know, at least when it happens, you go, okay, well, this is what Jesus said. You know, we're okay because at least we knew, you know, from the outset. But, uh, Jesus here in this illustration says that some people hear, they all hear the gospel and they all hear it the same way. And it's all the same message. And some of them, man, that sounds really good to me. Uh, I, I think I want to become a Christian. And they say that prayer, do that thing, make an altar call, whatever it might be. But as soon as a little difficulty comes, they go, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. And, uh, and that's a concern. <laughs> that's why we, we need to be praying for those what, 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 what aren't they doing? They're not really maturing in their faith and they're just, and they're just gone. The third type of uh, person that Jesus talks about is people that are like seed that fell among thorns. And uh, I was just uh, heard recently there's over 200 types of thorns in, uh, in Israel. And uh, the point is you pretty much would be very difficult to, to do a garden in Israel without some thorns ending up there. So this idea of thorns and what they represent... Uh, is almost to be uh, expected. And, uh, and, and what the thorns represent here are the worries of this life. Uh, King James, I think, says uh, the cares of this world. And the other thing that's mentioned is the deceitfulness of, uh, of riches. So there are those that can hear the gospel, appear to make at least an intellectual assent. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Yeah, they, they believe it they, uh, and so forth. Uh, but they, they, they apparently are not really saved because there's something that keeps them from really entering the kingdom of God. Now, there's a couple of things about this. And I, I, I did a little extra reading trying to see if I could come to some definitive thing. There's two views right here. One of them is that the, the first two guys are definitely not saved. But uh, maybe number three guy is. <laughs> maybe he gets saved. But he just never matures uh, because of uh, the cares of this world uh, and the deceitfulness of riches. He gets caught up in those. And so, you know, there, you know the thing rooted and everything, but there's just, you know, there's no fruit, you know, because it never m- matured. But, you know, and some would say that describes most of the Christians in the church today, the, the guys that hold that view, uh, never, never maturing. Uh, the other view is obvious that, no, this guy is not saved either. And the only guy that is, good ground and it produced some kind of fruit. And I have a tendency to lean towards that. Uh, in that direction. Uh, but either way, uh, certainly these things apply. What keeps people from coming to faith in Jesus Christ? The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of, of, of riches. Now, 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world or anything in the world. And he's literally saying, stop loving the world. It's our natural tendency to Love this world, this world system and what we can get out of it and how many toys we can collect and all the things that, you know, our culture teaches us that are important uh, and so forth. Uh, Again, this idea of the worries of this life that go along with it. Some people hear the gospel, might sound good to them. They don't get saved. They don't come to faith in Jesus Christ because well, well, what if that might be, you know, I mean, I don't want to like change who I am. You know, I might, I don't want to give up something. I mean, you know, they go through all these gyrations as though what they got going on in their life is more important than uh, eternity with God. You know, eh, no, I think that's a little more important. But again, they, they, they hang under these things. I think for us as believers in praying, here's something we can pray for. Man, I'm praying for George over there, but man, he is so gun ho on his career and his deal and what's going on. I can't get him to listen to the gospel, Lord. I pray that you'd set him free from that. You'd show him, Lord, that the cares of this world, the worries of this life are not worth it compared to eternity with you. 
That'd be a biblical prayer. I'm trying to see somebody get, get saved. Uh, and that's, those, are, <laughs> those are the good ones, by the way, the biblical ones. Uh, the ones where, we're, where we, we know that, man, this is God's will. People to get saved. This is what's preventing it. The more specific we can pray, the better. But I also want to say that there's a lot of Christians that don't mature for the same reason. Uh, the, you know, uh, the little bit of what God is doing in their lives is, uh, is, is choked out because of the, uh, the cares of, of this world. Again, uh, he makes reference to the, the deceitfulness of, of wealth. Uh, Paul tells Timothy that it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. And there he's, he's warning Christians. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, let me just regress there for, uh, for a moment since this is obviously speaks to uh, where we're at in our own culture. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So apparently people can miss out on the gospel. They can hear it. They can kind of get it in terms of an intellectual understanding. Uh, that's not the same kind of understanding used in the text here. But they, they, uh, it's in the right language. They, they, they get it and everything. But they choose against it because they would rather, they think it's going to uh, upset their apple cart of their, their career, their desires, and what their life is, is all about. And Jesus says those things are deceiving. They are deceitful. They are the root of all kinds of evil. Now, again, money is neutral. Uh, so just leave it in the offering box as you go on the way out there. Now, it's neutral. It's what you do with it. You know, is it directing your life? Is it, you know, do you, you know, make all your plans and choices uh, around it? Is it ruling over you? Because, again, according to Jesus, according to Paul, it can be very, uh, very deceitful. So, again, for the believer, the concern is materialism. Paul says it will cause us to miss out on a life of of contentment, and certainly it's a, a big issue in, in our in our culture. I, um, uh, we we've got the fact that by itself, intrinsically, apparently, it's deceitful. Uh, we've got our own self centeredness and our own sin nature that we're still dealing with. We've got a culture that says <laughs> that says you're not worth anything if you don't have any material gain. Uh, and then we've got a, uh, an advertising world that basically spends uh, millions of dollars every day to make us discontent as well. I mean, again, advertising doesn't come on and say, you're good, don't need our product. I mean, because after all, you probably already got six of these already. It doesn't do that, right? It's got to come on and, and make you discontent so that you will want to get this. So we're, we're bombarded with, <laughs> with discontentment all the time. Uh, it's the opposite of what God wants to have in our lives. It keeps us from uh, maturing in Christ. Now, let me read what Paul says in, in Philippians 4.11. He says, I've learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether they're well-fed or hungry, whether they're living in plenty or in want. Wow. Paul's learned the secret of being content. I want to know what <laughs> this secret is. Well, uh, first let's understand what the word means. The Stoic philosophers of Paul's day used that term all the time. Uh, contentment. And to them, it meant self-sufficiency, independent of circumstances. The materialist of our day would say self-sufficiency is the means to happiness, peace, joy, and so forth. If you can earn enough, have enough in the bank, would you, be, would you be a little more content if you didn't have a mortgage payment and had a house to live in? Oh, yeah. Paul says, no, you wouldn't. That, that, there, that's a deception. No, you wouldn't. I mean, that's a good thing to have. God bless you if you get there. But, uh, but that's an illusion, as though that would bring you contentment. But the materialist says those things will bring you contentment. Uh, the New Ager says, would say that, uh, this kind of contentment, this self-sufficiently sufficiency comes from this spiritual relationship as you get in contact with your inner self and, and so forth. So there's all the spiritual uh, journeys that you can go on to search for and seek out this self-sufficiency. Paul takes that term and kind of turns it on its ear and he says, here's, here's real self-sufficiency. Here's real contentment. You want to know how to get it? It's in 
is in verse 13. You know what it is? I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. That means no self-sufficiency. It means I rely totally upon the Lord. What is the secret of not getting caught up in these things? What is the secret of being content in every and every situation? Not trying to be self-sufficient. <laughs> and yet everything in our culture, I was just driven that way for years. The only reason I wanted to learn how to tear my little Volkswagen apart and put it back together again is so I could be self-sufficient. I wouldn't have to depend on the guy down the street to tune it up when I needed. I mean, everything I did was to be self-sufficient. And, uh, and yet... Uh, it's never going to uh, give us anything. Real contentment comes from Christ uh, and, our, our, uh, again, our dependence upon Him. When we, um, I thought about this and, and this idea of maybe a, 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 an illustration or a bigger picture of it. When we uh, would go uh, camping, we didn't make it this summer, and we'd go camping out there on Kapapa Island. Uh, it was, um, we would, uh, compared to our, our camping trips on the Big Island, which were a little... Basically, you're, in a, you're a little kayak and you've got to really watch your weight and how much you can take and so forth. So when we were doing Kapapa Island, it was like we had uh, Jim uh, taking his boat or Ron taking his boat. So, I mean, we had ice chests, ice. And this is like luxury, man. I got half and half for my coffee and I'm having steaks the first night. I and mean, we have like a nice tarp thing that we, we put up. And I mean, it's like blow up mattresses. I mean, we have a nice camp out there. And it's like guys would come out like the second night when the thing was all set up. And, and, and more than one person said this. Wow, you can live out here. You know, it's like compare. This is a relative term, of course, compared to our other camping trips uh, and everything. We've got gas lanterns. we got everything. It's great. Uh, why, why, why would they say that? Uh, some of you gals would say, I would never say that. But why, why, would, they, why, why would they say that? Uh, and, we're, and we would agree, man, this is great. We got it made because we're only there three nights. You know, if you're only if you're only somewhere for a couple of nights, you know what what you're willing to invest in in your little your little setup, your little living thing. It's a lot less. It's a lot less. And if you have the concept that that we're just pilgrims passing through and we're going to be with the Lord forever, the investment here is like it's a lot less. It's a lot. My contentment with whatever I got changes. If I'm only getting, you know, I can be content with a lot on Kapapa Island for three nights. I mean, it doesn't take much to make me happy. Half and half for my coffee in the morning. Little ice is really good. Man, one cold soda in the afternoon on that hot island. Hey, I'm loving it, you know. Uh, it just doesn't take a lot. Of course, it's real nice that they bring the surfboards out. And there's a little, But it doesn't take much. And we're just having a great old time out there. Why? Because we're only there for a few days. We're only here for a very short time as well. We're only here for a very short time. And then we're going to be with the Lord forever. That's why Paul can say, I've learned the secret of being content. What is it? I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And the stuff I can't, it probably doesn't matter anyway. Back to our parable. It's these things that keep people from coming to Christ. But I've, I've kind of built on here to say that it's the same kinds of things, according to Jesus and according to Paul, that keep Christians from maturing in their faith as well. Uh, and it's, it's not a small thing. It's, it's a very big thing. And it is a very wonderful thing to find that secret of contentment. Fourth thing is Jesus thought that some people are like the seed that fell on the good soil. And uh, how do we know it was good? Because it produced a crop a hundred times, 60 or, or even, uh, even 30. Verse 23 Again, it uh, starts out with a but, which is a contrasting term. So, but this guy compared to the other ones, but the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. It produces a crop yielding 160, 30 times uh, what was sown. So again, unlike the others, uh, something really happens here. Uh, the term that uh, when it says that, that he understands it, uh, it doesn't just mean, oh, good, it must have been in his language or something. No, it, that term means he applied it. He applied it. He heard the gospel and then he applied it to himself. The others heard it. Now, they understood it in terms of it was in the right language and with the right terminology and it was explained well and so forth. But the difference with this guy is that he actually applied it again. People are saved because they 
they basically understand the information intellectually. They believe that it's true, but that's not enough. They have to put their trust in it. It's like God is reaching down and we've got to, we've got to reach out. And again, the classic illustration uh, told often is uh, of the great Blondin. His uh, two grandsons used to be in our, our church. They're both uh, young army uh, enlisted guys at the time, but their grandfather, the great Blondin, was... Uh, he invented extreme sports, you know, in the turn of the century. One of these guys would climb up on top of buildings and hang out and stuff. And one of his big feats that he was famous for, not only uh, in England, but uh, uh, in the United States, was walking across, uh, you know, wire cables. And they strung a cable across the Niagara Falls. And he took a wheelbarrow, you know, a big press conference. He's kind of the evil can evil of his day, you know. And he pushes the wheelbarrow across, comes back again, ah, and then he says to the crowd, you know, how many believe I can do it again? Oh, we all believe you can do it again. All right, who would like to get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> See, the gospel is not just saying, I believe you can do it. It's actually getting in the wheelbarrow. Why is it that some people seem to hear it and, and, and seem to agree with what you're saying, but you never see any change in their life? Because they've never gotten in the wheelbarrow. They've never really trusted and turned their life over to Jesus Christ. Because God come in the flesh. He died for my sins. Why in the world would I not submit my life to Him? Follow His teachings. Ask for His help. So on and so forth. And what happens is then things change. And there's fruit in our lives. Uh, the third thing here is the illustration is meant to give us understanding and uh, I think an encouragement as well. What do we learn from the parable? I think the most important thing and again, just a warning about parables is that there's there's usually one basic truth that's taught. And we don't want to try to dissect so much. It would be wrong to say, does that mean uh, one out of four people that you share with are going to get saved? No, there's no mention of percentages or anything here. It's just these are reasons why people don't. And here's why why they do. Uh, and they do it because of the power of the seed itself. The sower himself is is kind of anonymous. It's not because he was really good. He was a great farmer. He was a great farmer. Very skilled, Jesus says. No, he's <laughs> just a guy throwing seed. The power is in the seed. What's the seed? It's the Word of God. Uh, Peter says this. He says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. People don't get saved because you're really good at sharing the Gospel. <laughs> People get saved because of the truth of God's Word. Does that, does that take a little burden off you? I mean, you're just the messenger. It's not how good you are at it. Oh, they didn't get saved. i, I got to work at this here. I'm not, you know, pray more. That'd be great. But it's not you. It's, it's the seed. It's the Word of God that saves people. That's, that's obviously one of the things that's uh, emphasized here. Paul says in Romans uh, 10, 17, Consequently, faith comes by hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. The other thing that's obvious is that somebody's still got to deliver the word. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, you don't you don't need a, a college degree in sharing the gospel. We used to do little demonstrations. We got a little track rack back there just to help people take the track. And you're right if you're right-handed, and you say, "Would you like one of these?" You know, if you're left-handed, would you like one of these? It's not very difficult. Anybody about anybody could do it. Need a little. Brush up, follow up course afterwards. We have to help you, right handed or left handed. Can I give you something to read? That's the second line. If you want to try a second line, can I give you something to read? You can work on it. <laughs> but the power is in the word. But the point is, they're not going to get saved if nobody tells them. So the, it's still got to get delivered. Secondly, the harvest will be determined by the condition of the soil or the condition of the heart. And therefore, as we mentioned early, prayer is, is uh, incredibly critical. And third, <clears throat> the heart that receives the gospel can produce a huge crop. And I think that's the main point of the thing. It's meant to give us encouragement. I mean, you're out sharing with friends and family members, and maybe once in a while somebody gets saved. But you don't know. You, know, you don't know which one is going to produce that, that hundredfold crop. You know, and, and it's exciting, <clears throat> not over a few weeks, but if, you're, if you hang in there for a while... In a couple of decades, you can look back and see amazing things. You know, when uh, Kathy and I first got married, uh, really none of her siblings were saved at all. And we prayed and, 
And over time, they, they all came to faith in Christ. And, and lo and behold, her sister Doreen ends up marrying Strath, who is our associate pastor. And now she's praying for him every weekend as he's out almost every weekend on behalf of Gospel for Asia, going all over the country. He was down in kind of the southern part of Texas this weekend. And, uh, and every, every week, Strat's out there and uh, he's sharing about Gospel for Asia. And then, and then three or four or five or six or eight or 30 or 40 missionaries get supported every weekend, every weekend, every weekend. Those missionaries are in India preaching the Gospel and 10 people are getting saved, and 20 people are getting saved, and 30 people. And so, that's a big multiplication. Why? Because Doreen came to faith in Christ. She's there serving. She's part of that ministry. Strap came here. It's like, that's a big multiplication. That's way more than 100 times. I think this is meant to be an encouragement. We, we want to, of course, you know, with us, there's, there's certain family members and friends. We just want to see them get saved because we love them. But we need to be open to sharing with others as well. Because we never, the power is in the seed and we never know which one is the hundredfold guy, gal, that is just going to, man, just God's going to use them in a, in a tremendous way. And, uh, and you probably, you could look back over your life uh, and, and you know some of, those, some of those people. And certainly we, we want to all pray that uh, we're at least a thirtyfold <laughs> in terms of uh, producing fruit in our lives. But uh, the power is in the gospel and it's amazing what the gospel can do in a person's heart. When a person hears it and then applies it to their life, God changes them and then uses them as he's used us to impact and influence others. That's, that's the heart of the, of the parable. That's how Jesus begins His parable teaching. The kingdom of God, the Messianic kingdom, has been rejected by that generation. It's all going to change now, boys. It's going to be an individual thing. People individually are going to get saved. People individually are going to come into the kingdom of God. And they are going to be to me like brothers and sisters and a mother to me. I care for them so much. This is how it's going to work. You guys are going to go out and you're going to deliver the goods. You're just the, the farmer. Nothing special about you, but there's something very special about the words that you're delivering. And you watch and you see what happens. Hey, don't get bummed out. People reject. Don't get bummed out. People are all enthusiastic. Yeah, this is really great. And then they kind of fade away. <clears throat> That's going to happen. Don't get bummed out if you get persecuted. That's going to happen. Don't get bummed out if it seems like all men hate you. That's okay. Because, hey, in the end, this is going to be great. And we're going to be with the Lord forever. Amen. We are